welcome to the worship services of the First Missionary Baptist Church in Huntsville. We're striving to become one of the most loving churches in all the world. Please join us now for a portion of our worship service. Now you see, Jesus is smart. He knows that miracles are made to teach lessons. And they are made to bless folks' lives. And if he had turned that stone or those stones into bread, it wouldn't have helped Satan. Because Satan wasn't going to believe anyway. He couldn't be strengthened. He was a devil. And that's all a devil is, is a devil. So Jesus looked at him and said, listen, devil, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So get out of my way. Later on, Satan came back to him. Another temptation. This time he tipped him to the lust of popularity. He said, now Jesus, I'm paraphrasing now. Jesus, I hear that you want to build a great kingdom. And you know, Jesus did talk about the kingdom of God all the way through the gospel. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. I know you're going to build a great kingdom. Yeah, but Jesus, the easy way to build this great kingdom is not to go to Calvary and, and, and suffer the way you're going to have to do it. But man, just be spectacular. Just be sensational. Become popular through your sensationalism. And here's how you can do it. See see this great temple here in Jerusalem? You go and get up on the top of that temple and then go all the way up to the steeple. They call it pinnacle in that day. And get at the very peak of the pinnacle and draw a crowd, man. Stay up there uh, until the crowd is big. When all the crowd is big, and man, their eyes are just focused on you. You got them in your hand. You got their attention. And when you see that you got all of their attention, jump! And let me tell you something else. Jump because it's already written. You will not even cut your foot on a stone. Satan uses the scripture to try to get Jesus to act a fool. But he wouldn't jump. He just pushed Satan aside, went on about his business. Because he knew that God didn't call him to galvanize and mobilize disciples through sensationalism through being spectacular. And that's why it bothers me today when some of us in the pulpit get too sensational. I told you some time ago that I don't even like wearing rings. Particularly when I preach, I wear my wedding band, but that's all I wear it when you're married. But I don't like drawing attention to myself. That's why I wear robes almost every Sunday. Because I remember back when I was in college and pastoring church in Nashville and I had a certain young man to come preach for me. I remember after the first few nights of preaching, all they were talking about is how sharp he was. <laughs> and he was. I mean, that Negro was a dresser. <laughs> and, and he was neatly built and his clothes, coats and all, they hang neatly on him, you know. I mean, he was sharp. I give him credit for that. He was sharp. I even admired his being sharp. But in the pulpit, there's no place for folk to be drawn to our dress. They ought to be drawn to Jesus. Hide me behind the cross. Folk may see your glory. They didn't want to jump so you can be sensational and spectacular. 
folk can look at you and follow you because you are so sensational and spectacular. By the way, that's why a whole lot of folk follow Trump. He was a celebrity, had a 10-year running show on NBC. That's why he could talk about little Rubio, lying Ted, crooked Hillary, and get away with it because he was a celebrity. And he still is a celebrity. And some crazy folk still hung up on his celebrity. We're not called to be celebrities. We're called to be servants. And I ain't talking about the president-elect either. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. <laughs> and the third way... Jesus was tempted in all points, <clears throat> just as we are, but without sin. After Satan couldn't get him on those earlier temptations, temptation, lust through the appetite and lust through the popular, he then tried lust for the power, because he knows all of us want to be powerful. It's one of the greatest temptations in the world is to be powerful, and that's part of Trumpism. Oh, yeah, that's part of his problem. He loves being powerful. And that's why he likes to be down on other folk. That's right. If you all uh, listened to some of that stuff when the campaign was going on, you know what one of the lawyers told him early in his life? He said, man, if they hit you, hit them ten times harder. Which means if they beat on you, beat them ten times harder. And he bought the philosophy. And it works for him. But it ain't going to work in the end. It's going to get him killed because Satan will fool anybody because his temptations are luring. They are beautiful. They sound so profound, but when they grip you and they have you, they'll take you all the way down to the guttermost parts of the world. And they'll take you so low you can't get up by yourself. So, so, so Satan tempts Jesus through power. He takes him, the Bible says, up into a high mountain. And there he shows him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory and in their grandeur. And he says, now, Jesus, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give them all to you. Don't take that long route you're talking about. Going to Calvary, dying for the sin of the world, galvanizing and mobilizing your disciples by giving your life. Don't do that. Just bow down to me. I'll give them to you. Jesus looked at that rascal and said, look at him. You ain't got no king. I'm paraphrasing. You ain't got no kingdoms to give in the first place. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Get behind me, man. It's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and only him shall you serve. He was tempted. In all points, just as we are, but without sinning. And because he was tempted in all points, as we are, without sinning, he can help us. He is our preeminent high priest who can be touched by our weaknesses. So he says, wherever you're weak today, I can help you. That if your weakness is the fact that you've been rejected and, and you're wrestling with your rejection, it's, it's, it's getting you down. He, he says, listen, I've been there before you. I, I, I've already walked a mile in your moccasins. I've already sat where you are sitting. I've already gone through what you are going through. If you ever feel rejected, remember, at first, I was rejected because I came unto my own. And my own would not receive me. My own folk turned their backs on me. He said, if you ever get depressed and you have a dark night of the soul, or if you ever get lonely and you can't handle your loneliness, at Christmas time you miss somebody that you used to have in your life and it's cutting at you, it's eating at you, it's making you depressed. Just remember, your depression cannot begin to match mine. He said, uh, on Calvary, 
I was in such a state of loneliness and depression because I was separated from God momentarily. And when I felt the abysmal pain of being separated from God, I cried out, my God, my God, have you also left me? Why have you forsaken me? You can't begin to understand that. I felt cosmic depression and loneliness. He said, if you're gripped by bereavement, I don't know what you feel. Other folk tell you, I know what you feel. He said, no, no, I'm the one who knows what you feel. I know what you feel because I've been gripped by the bite of bereavement. I stood at Lazarus' grave, one of my best friends on the earth, and I watched his sisters cry at his death. And I stood getting ready to raise him up, but I felt the pain of what death and sin had done in the world, and I cried too. It's in the Bible, Jesus wept, isn't it? It was at Lazarus' grave where it says he wept. He wept because sin had brought death in the world. And God's world was not designed for death. There was no death in Eden. Death came when man sinned. Woman sinned. Jesus felt that bite of sin, bereavement, and he wept at Lazarus' grave. So if you're facing bereavement, he says, I know what you feel. I've been there before you got there. If you ever feel mistreated and misrepresented and about to cry because it's like the world is against you, he said, I've been there. He said, when I was on earth trying to help people and teach people and save people and lead people, they called me out of my name. I was the son of God. And they called me Beelzebub, the chief devil. The religious leaders, supposedly the best generation of the day, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of those who represent what was supposed to be the best of Judaism, our religion, they were the ones who called me a devil. And not only a devil, but said I was the chief devil. So when they scandalize your name and misrepresent you and lie on you, just remember they did it to me first. Not only did they call me Beelzebub, but they spat in my face. Good Lord from Zion. If you'd walk up here this morning and challenge me in this pulpit and spit in my face, ain't no telling what I may do. <laughs> God help me. They spat in his face. He took it like a man. No, he took it like a God. He said, whatever you face, I'll face it before you. Tempted in all points, just as we are, but without sin. That's why he can help. And that's why he's our Savior. Nobody else can be our Savior other than Jesus because they haven't been where we have been. They have not been touched by our infirmities. They don't understand our weaknesses. But he understands every weakness that we have. You don't have it. I don't have a weakness that he doesn't understand. So we bring us to the third point. There are four points, but I'm going to try to make these last two shorter. Let us embrace Jesus because he has opened for us the throne of grace. Now, I've already indicated that in what I just finished saying, but I need to press it just for the elaboration of the concept. Because, you see, the text says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. That's a wonderful verse, isn't it? Let us therefore, because of who Jesus is, the 
preeminent high priest and what he's done. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. Well, prior to Jesus, when you talked about the throne of God, there was that idea of God being enthroned in the Holy of Holies and God being enthroned in heaven as Isaiah saw him high and lifted up, you know, on his throne, robe of his train filled the temple, came all the way out of heaven down in the temple. You see, the throne of God was a throne of majesty, a throne of power and splendor and glory, a throne of sovereignty and wealth because God owned everything, owned all of the spiritual blessings and all of the material blessings. So when you looked at the throne of God, that's what you saw, God and his awesome holiness because angels were up there veiling their faces in his presence and just shouting in song holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's what you saw at the throne of God. And then you get over in the book of Revelation and the throne of God becomes a throne of judgment. The great white throne of judgment where folk are going to come before the judgment bar of God, as the old preachers used to say, and God is going to judge them. So that's what you saw as the throne of God. But the writer of Hebrews says God's throne has now been transformed, as it were, or brought down lower to us to understand it with a new perspective. The throne of God has become the throne of grace. Because Jesus has revolutionized the concept of the throne of God and made it become a throne of grace because God is a God of love. And that's the thing that separates the Old Testament from the New Testament. In the New Testament, throughout the New Testament, God is a God of love. God is a God of grace. God is a God of mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. And I believe Reverend Lynn is going to preach that later today in the next service. That, but God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He turned the throne of God into a throne of grace. That's why I like John Newton. That's why the church ought to keep singing it. We don't sing it much around here now, but we ought to sing it more. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Let me back up and say that better. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Twas grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. God's throne becomes a throne of grace, a throne of help where you and I can go in time of what? Need. Whenever we need him, the throne of grace is open. I don't care what your need is. You name it, he can cover your need. I don't care how big a sinner you are, he can handle your sins. I don't care how low you've gone, he can pick you up. I don't care how far out you've gone, he can bring you in. He has a throne of grace. And we can find help in time of need. Since I'm too long, that final point I want to lift up is that we ought to embrace Jesus because he saves fully, completely, and eternally. 
Verse 25 is the last verse that I'll touch on this morning. Wherefore, he's able to save to the uttermost those who come unto God by him since he ever lives to make intercessions for us. Close when I tell you these few things. He says, as I just indicated, from the guttermost to the uttermost. He says, because he's the Savior. He says, because he's able to save. No, nobody else is able to save like Jesus. Because they don't have the power and the authority and the love and the grace and the mercy that Jesus had. All right, all right. So he can save to the uttermost. Yeah. You see, the problem with some of your other saviors is the fact that you think you're saved when you're out there following them. But when you get in hard times and difficult days and tough situations, you discover they can't help. Even the devil can fool you and have you following him because he knows how to lure in marvelous and even tricky ways. And his allurement can be beautiful. It can look so wholesome. But in the end, it's death. It's totally unlike Jesus. Jesus saves in a way that gets tough along the way. Because the three movements of his salvation are justification, sanctification, and glorification. When he saves you, he justifies you. When he saves you, he sanctifies you. When he saves you, he glorifies you. But the New Testament tells us that all of that, except justification, becomes a process. When he justifies us, we slide smoothly into sanctification. And sanctification is a long process. But for that's when he works in us, both to will and to do according to his own good pleasure. And so as long as you and I live upon the earth, he's just working in us day after day, working out our salvation, bringing it toward fruition. When the day of glorification shall come, when we'll be just like him, and over that long process, my dears, uh, sometimes it gets rough. Uh, but he can handle the roughness uh, of our situations. Uh, sometimes uh, we face some dark nights uh, and some long days. Uh, but he can handle the long days uh, and the dark nights. Uh, sometimes uh, we go through periods of sickness uh, and distress. Uh, but he can handle that also uh, because he is the preeminent savior and the preeminent priest. Uh, and the reason he's able to do that because the Bible says in this closing verse, uh, he lives forever to make intercession for us. Uh, you see, my dears, uh, the reason he saves uh, in the beginning, uh, in the middle, uh, in the end and all the way in between because he's always alert. He's back up there at the right hand of the throne of God and he ever lives to make intercessions for us. These other gurus are going to let you down because they're going to die. Muhammad is dead. 
Buddha is dead. Uh, Confucius is dead. Uh, all the rest of the leaders of religion are dead. Uh, but Jesus is alive. Uh, alive uh, at the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, at the right hand of power. Uh, interceding uh, for you and for me. Uh, let me close uh, on Simon Peter. Oh, Simon Peter sinned uh, along the way, uh, denied Jesus three times uh, in one night. Uh, you can't get any worse than that. Uh, turning your back uh, on Jesus uh, three times uh, in one night. Uh, and then the rooster crowed uh, and reminded Simon Peter of what Jesus had said. Uh, and uh, Jesus passed out of the courtroom uh, and old Simon was over there old lion Simon and Jesus didn't curse him out he didn't scold him he didn't fuss at him he just looked at him and when he looked at Simon Peter it hurt him deep in his heart and Simon went out and wept bitterly wept profusely wept his way all the way back in the arms of Jesus because Jesus ever lives to make intercessions for us. And later on, here's what Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. That's why my salvation is secure. He's praying for me. That's why your salvation is secure. He's praying for you. He's at the right hand of the throne of God, ever alive, making it the sessions for you and for me. I'm glad Mama prayed for me. I'm glad Daddy prayed for me. I'm glad you pray for me, but I'm so glad Jesus is praying for me. No power like his prayers. No power like his prayers. When he prays, Satan shakes. When he prays, hell is disturbed. When he prays, good things happen. When he prays, souls are made better. When he prays, we get more mature. When he prays, he draws us closer to God. Thank God Jesus is praying for you and for me. This morning, he's praying. Right now, he's praying. I'm glad he's praying for us. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? I am mighty glad. For he ever lives. Make intercession. 